to today's CLC lecture series. My name is Hazel and I'm from the Centre for Livable Cities. The centre was jointly established by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources in 2008 to distill, create and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. The CLC lecture series is one of the platforms through which urban thought leaders share best practices and exchange ideas and insights. In today's session, we are honoured to have with us Professor Michael Norton, Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. In this lecture, Professor Norton will share his research and insights to how showing more of what the government is doing could increase trust amongst the public and their consciousness of the government's involvement in program. Today's lecture will begin with a presentation by Professor Norton, followed by a moderated discussion and a Q&A session with the audience, which will be moderated by Wei Neng, an adjunct researcher at CLC. With this, let us begin the session by inviting Professor Norton on stage. Professor Norton, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to... Uh the center for hosting me uh, on this visit, and um, thanks all of you for coming. It just it started to rain just before, so thanks if you came from outside for braving the rain uh, and coming to uh, hear this. So I'll talk for a little while, uh, and then um, we'll have a moderated discussion, and then um, I'm happy to take questions. And really, I'd like to leave lots of time for questions because I'd rather hear your reactions to the kind of research that we've uh, been doing. So um, this idea of transparency and trust is sort of an interesting one to us. Uh, because it seems to touch a lot of domains of life. One of those domains is government, and of course I'll spend some time talking about the research we've done on transparency with government, but I'll also talk about a lot of examples and a lot of projects that we've done not with government, but with other kinds of organizations, just to give a sense of the broad range of projects that we have where we try to think about how transparency can improve people's perceptions of any organization, whether it's a government or a nonprofit or a for-profit, or as I always like to start with, pizza. Uh, so uh, anybody here ever ordered pizza from Domino's? So let me see your hands. Uh huh. Mainly men. Uh, yeah, uh, anybody ordered after uh, midnight an emergency pizza? couple of people, mainly men. Uh, so uh, when you order from Domino's, uh, in general when you order uh, food by, for delivery, what used to happen was you would call them up and then you would just wait and then at some point hopefully the food would show up. And that's not a very pleasant experience for a lot of reasons. One is just you don't know when it's coming, but the other is you don't know where it is in the process. So a few years ago in the States, and then actually launched uh, all over the, the world, including in Singapore, I just checked the website uh, here, Domino's Pizza started what they called the Domino's Pizza Tracker. And it's a little bit hard to read, but if you look closely, you can see that what the Pizza Tracker does is you order your uh, pizza online, and then they send you to the Pizza Tracker website where you can track the progress of your pizza. And the steps are things like uh, baking, putting it in the box, uh, delivering it, prepping something, all of the steps that go into making a pizza. And what's cool is you can watch it as it happens, and when the step happens, when prep is done, it lights up, and then it goes on to the next step. So you know the whole time with your pizza exactly what uh, stage of the process it is. And I actually just checked, and in Singapore, you can not only see when it's out for delivery, but you can click, and you can use GPS, and you can follow the driver on the streets as they come to you, and they take a wrong turn and you get really mad and then they turn around and you're, yay, the pizza's coming. So it's super interesting. So it was a huge hit, the Domino's Pizza Tracker, um, mainly, mainly with the men who were ordering pizza. Also actually with parents, with kids, because when you're waiting for the pizza to get there, the kids are going out of their minds waiting for the pizza. And now they'll just stare at the Domino's Pizza Tracker and wait for it to light up until the pizza comes. So for us, this is an interesting example of, again, what we call transparency, where a company is actually letting you see into the process of what they're doing for you. And what I like about the Domino's example in particular is that you're not really getting any new information. So one nice thing that it's giving you is an estimate of the time, and that's real information, so you don't just have to sit there and wonder when the pizza is coming. But the steps that it's filling up as it goes, it's not like you didn't know that those were happening anyway. 
So you know when you order a pizza that they probably have to prep it and then bake it and put it in a box and then bring it to you. And you also already knew that that was the order. You know, it doesn't go put it in the box and then bake it because that would be a disaster. So we know the steps and yet we still like to see them happening. And that's the intuition of transparency is that even when we know in some way or another what's going on, that some service is being provided for us, there's something very psychologically compelling about having the feeling that it's happening and being able to see it happening. And in particular, this feeling that someone is working for you. We really like to feel like there's a person who is scrambling around doing stuff for us because it means we're really important. And the more we can see into the process of thinking of a Domino's person running around with our pizza and then driving, the more we feel really good about the output of that process. So this is just one example. And what I want to talk about is a bunch of the research that we've done in many different domains to explore what happens when we reveal the inner workings of some process, both with for-profit businesses and also with government, and then the psychology of what's happening. When does it work? When does it not work? What's the best way to be transparent? And what are the downsides to being transparent? So um, one thing that I want to say is that when I say transparency, I don't mean um, just honesty. So this isn't kind of a um, you know, government sharing all of its information at all times, although I think that can be useful as well. And it's also not telling people that you are transparent. So if you tell people all the stuff you're doing for them, you actually just sound like you're bragging a little bit. You know, if I told you, here's the nine favors I did for you today, you would say, Mike's kind of a jerk because you're not supposed to tell people all the things you do for them. Transparency is this idea that you show people through your actions what you're doing for them. In other words, I do favors for you without saying I'm doing them for you. You'll think I'm a nicer guy. And when companies, instead of telling you all these things they're doing, show you the things that they're doing, that's when we see consumers and citizens really having a positive reaction to the services that they're uh, receiving. So we call it showing your work, literally, this idea that things are happening. Usually we make them invisible. Let's make them more visible to people and see what it does to their attitudes uh, toward us. So the original intuition for this came from uh, an interaction that we had with, of all people, a locksmith. So uh, it turns out we had done this research a few years ago on what we called the IKEA effect, which is this funny effect that happens to us where when we make things with our own hands, we really, really overvalue them. So many of you probably took a pottery class at some point in your lives, and you made a really ugly mug or a really terrible bowl that's all lopsided and crooked. Or maybe you took a watercolor class and you painted a terrible picture, and you've kept that your whole life. You still have it. You made a bookcase one time and you kept that your whole life. Uh, if you didn't do it yourself, you're probably thinking of your partner or spouse who has one of those, and you always wonder why they really like that thing. So it's a very common uh, effect. We call it the IKEA effect because it also happens when you put together IKEA furniture. It's all lopsided and you forgot some of the pieces, but you love the thing that you made now. So a really funny thing where when we put our own effort into tasks, we come to overvalue them. We talked to this locksmith as part of that. So we talked to people who work with their hands to find out what it's like to work with your hands and why it's so psychologically meaningful. And unexpectedly, this guy told us this story. So this guy was a master locksmith. He was a guy, you get locked out of your house, he shows up, he has one little tool that he uses, and he just walks up to your door and just basically pokes the lock and your door flies open. He's amazing. And he told us this story of when he started out as a locksmith, he was really bad at it because he was learning how to do it. So what he would do is he'd come to your door and he'd try 50 different tools and he would kind of have to break the door and break the lock and everything was broken and he was sweating and swearing and it took hours for him to get into your house. He was doing a terrible job, but when he was done, you got inside and he would say, that'll be $250. And people said, okay, and they paid him. And what he found was that as he got better and better at opening doors, when he walked up to your door and just put one tool in and it popped open, and then he said, that'll be $250, people got really mad. <laughs> and they refused to pay him because they said, that was too easy. You didn't do any work. Why should I have to pay you for that? Now, what they're totally insensitive to is the fact that he put in hundreds and thousands of hours of practice to get that good. All we see is, well, it looked easy for him. I shouldn't have to pay him. So he told us that what he started doing was slowing down. 
So he would deliberately go up to your door and use the wrong tools for a while and swear a little bit and start sweating so it looked like he was trying really hard. And then after about 20 minutes, he'd take out the good one and go, boo, and open your door and ask for $250. And it's super interesting to think about. So why would we care that the guy is sweating and working hard? All we want is to get into our house. And if you think about it, wouldn't we like to get in sooner rather than later? Of course we would. That's the whole reason we called him. But this other effect happens where we love to see, as I said earlier, people working for us. And his intuition that he independently realized was the more he looks like he's working for you, the happier you are to pay him a lot of money. And that's exactly the intuition that we'll use in a bunch of the examples that I'll show you where when we show people someone or something working hard, just like the locksmith working hard, it turns out that independent of how good the outcome is, we really like the process more and seeing that effort really makes us actually like the outcome more even though the outcomes are exactly the same. So the first example that I'll show you is in travel. Uh, this was the very first experiment uh, project that we did uh, in this domain. So if you've ever searched for a flight online, uh, you may have used either Orbitz or Kayak or both or any other travel website where you search for flights. These two are particularly interesting because when you search for a flight on Orbitz, it's still the case today actually that what happens, you know, you enter in, I need to go from this city to this city, on um, this date and here's the times I need to go and you click search. What happens with orbits is the screen turns blue and then a blue progress bar slowly fills up until the search is done and then it shows you the results. It's pretty typical, that's what waiting screens usually look like. But Kayak on the other hand, if you've ever used Kayak, same exact thing, you know, I need to go this city to that city on this date and here's the times I need to go. You click search, Kayak shows you a screen where it says, now we're searching through Singapore Airlines. Now we're searching through American. Now we're searching through United. And as it does that, it updates the flights as it goes. So it kicks the bad ones out and keeps the good ones in. Then at the end, it basically shows you the exact same flights that Orbit's found for you. So really what you should care about is, are these prices good and are these times convenient? But we had this intuition, just like the locksmith working and sweating, that seeing this stuff happen, would for some reason make people think that is a terrific website. I really like the way it's doing that. And now I'm really likely to buy a ticket because I really think it did a good job. So we created our own travel website to test this. Uh, we called it uh, Travel Finder because we're not really very creative. <laughs> and we drew that plane, which we were super happy about because that's the limits of our artistic skills, <laughs> is that little plane. And it's just a simulated travel website. So people search on it for flights. Same interface as every other website. Where do you want to go? Search for a flight. But then we randomly assign people to see different versions of the search process. So some people, let's say you guys over here, randomly got to see what we call the blind version. And that looks like this. It's like orbits. It's just a search bar that slowly, a progress bar that slowly fills up. And then when that thing is done, you got to see a bunch of flights. That's the boring one, but that's actually business as usual for most websites when they're searching is they just show you that and then they show you what they found. Then we did what we call the transparent website. Imagine you guys logged on and tried to search and instead of getting this progress bar, you got this. So you can see it says now we're searching Continental, now we're searching US Airways, AirTran, it's going through. The progress bar is still there, but the flights are updating as well. So it's cycling through things and showing you stuff. In the end, we showed people in these two different groups the exact same set of flights. But we asked them, would you like to buy a flight? Is this a good website? Would you recommend it to your friends? And people who saw the blind website with the progress bar really liked the site a lot less, and they were much less likely to buy a ticket. The exact same <laughs> flight results. So there's no difference in the output. It's just the process of seeing it that really changed people's perceptions. And we asked, uh, we tried a couple different versions of this as well. So you can always play when something is searching. There's all kinds of things you can show while it's searching to try to entertain people. So one thing that we did was uh, while you're searching and you click search, we do uh, upselling. So we say, oh, we see you're going to Las Vegas. Here are some other things you could do in Las Vegas. Click on them if you want to buy them. And I'll tell you that people hate it. <laughs> so when you're waiting for a search to finish, you really don't want to be sold other things. You just want to see the results. So that doesn't work. 
We did one that we thought might work actually, which we called entertainment. And this one, after you click search, an interactive game of tic-tac-toe pops up and you play with the computer. So it starts with you know, an O somewhere and then you put an X and you play the whole game. And people really loved playing that game. They were delighted that while they were waiting they got to play a game. But it didn't actually make them like the website more. So it isn't just that when you see the work being done it's interesting and fun. Because when you play a game it's interesting and fun but that doesn't seem to change your perceptions that this is a really good website that I should buy from. It's only when you show the work being done that people really start to say this is a great service that I really want to buy from. And our hardest test that we compared this to was, so imagine two groups of people again. You guys this time instead of getting the blind where it fills up, what we actually gave you was you click search and you get your search results immediately. Right away without waiting at all. And this group over here has to wait for 30 seconds for the flight results to come up. And if uh, in an online environment, waiting for 30 seconds is like waiting for six or seven days in the real world. I mean, it's a really long amount of time to wait online. The difference is though, in the 30 seconds that you were doing this, we showed you the work. And it turns out that the people who wait 30 seconds and see the work like it more than the people who get it right away. And even more surprisingly, when we have the same people try both, the majority of people choose the one that makes them wait for 30 seconds and shows the work than the one that gives them their results right away. We always think when we're providing services of any kind that faster is always better. And very often faster is better. We like things right away. But there are other things that come into play like is this website doing a good job? I'd like to see some work being done before I'm sure that I really like this website. And it turns out that when we see the work being done, we really like it a lot. Now, by the way, if we make people wait for 30 seconds with the blind thing versus right away, everyone picks right away. So we don't like to wait. We only like to wait when we see work being done. But my favorite part of this whole study is we also ask people a bunch of questions about the website, about their feelings about the website, which is kind of funny because we shouldn't really have feelings about websites. It turns out they're, they don't have any feelings for us but we still have feelings for websites. And we asked them this question. We said, as you were um, waiting for your results, how hard was the algorithm working for you? So think about what, what the heck does that question even mean? Do algorithms work for you? No, it's just a computer program. Do they work hard or not hard? Well, no, it's just an algorithm that's programmed. But we found that when people saw the thing happening, they actually were very likely to say, the algorithm was working very hard for me. They felt that, almost like the locksmith. So we, in a weird way, the things that happen in the real world, we bring them into online environments and have the same kind of emotional reactions as there. And by the way, that feeling that the algorithm is working hard for you is a huge predictor of whether you buy a ticket. So the feeling that all that work is being done, more than anything else about the website, is what drove you to say, I really like these results and I'm really gonna buy a ticket. Okay, so we've talked about pizza, and we've talked about uh, travel. Let's think of some other domains where we could insert. So then we start, started to think, wow, where else could we show the work being done and figure out if people have better reactions? So we thought and thought, and we came up with what we thought was the most important human domain uh, of all. And that was the domain of online dating. So uh, we figured that we would try to see if we could improve people's experience with online dating. I would do a show of hands for who's done online dating, but sometimes that can be embarrassing. I don't know what's more embarrassing, online dating or ordering pizza online. If you've ever done both at the same time, that's a very, very bad sign for how well you're doing. So we tried it with online dating. Online dating, and by the way, this is bizarre in its own right, is a lot like searching for a flight, where you enter a bunch of attributes about someone, and then you click search, and then after you click, you know, you say, I want someone in this age range, this height, make this much money, this much education, whatever else you care about. And then you click search and right away, right away, it says, here's a whole bunch of faces that are good matches for you. And by the way, it's like not just one page, it's 30 pages of faces. So think about the psychology of that. So imagine, let's go back to the real world again. You know, the locksmith analogy is a good one to understand why we like to see the website working for us. Here the, the analogy isn't the locksmith so much, it's think about if you ask a friend of yours to fix you up on a date with someone. 
you know, you say to your friend, you know, I'd like to find somebody special. Can, can you think of anyone who I'd really click with and get along with? Imagine if, without hesitating for a second, they listed off 30 names. Would you really trust those names very much? Not really. Wouldn't you want your friend to stop and think a little about all the people they know and what you're like and what they're like and kind of think and think and think and then say, maybe these people are good for you. That feels more like, well, I'm glad they put some thought and effort into the search for my soulmate instead of just saying the first 30 people that came to mind. But that's exactly what happens on online dating websites is they just basically say, yeah, we see what you want, bam, here's everybody, and they don't put any thought into it. So we do the exact same thing that we do with flying, which is that we show you the process. So imagine instead of getting the results right away, what happens instead is it says, now we're looking for people in your height range. Now we're looking for people in your age range. Now we're looking for people with your hobbies. Now we're looking for, and as it does it, it updates the search results. That's a little bit more like your friend putting some time and thought into finding your soulmate. And what we find is that people really like the site a lot more, and they're even more likely to say, I think my soulmate is in these results, if it has thought about it and gone through this process. And it's actually a pretty big effect because people really don't trust these results and they really trust the results where the thing puts some thought into it. We did a f an even more fun version, uh, by the way, where faces come up, as it's searching through your options, faces come up one by one of the people that it's considering, and if they match, it keeps them, and if they don't match, they explode. <laughs> and I can't tell you how much people love this, and I can't tell you even more how much in particular women love this. <laughs> I don't know why exactly, but women love to see terrible men explode. <laughs> so, and again, in the end, we're showing you the same results as we would have. And you know when you click search that what it's doing is eliminating people, right? That's the whole point of a search engine. It finds good ones and it gets rid of bad ones. But if we visualize it for you so you viscerally feel the effort, it really dramatically changes your perceptions of how good the results are. And my favorite version of this actually is... Um, something that we call uh, recommendation and rejection agents. So uh, again, in the domain of online dating, if you have ever bought anything online, what happens after that for the rest of your life is they try to recommend other things that you should buy. So they say, because you bought this, you might also buy this, or people like you bought this, so you should buy this as well. Constantly, they're sort of saying, buy these things, buy these things. We know what you like. We know what you like. And if you think, again, if you think of an interpersonal analogy, I'm a social psychologist, so I always think of face-to-face -face interactions and then how do these play out with bigger organizations. This kind of idea of, um, I know what you like, it's easy to know what people like. For example, now you know that I like blue suits because I'm wearing a blue suit. But you don't know if I like gray suits or brown suits because you haven't seen me choose between them. And it would probably take you a while to figure out if I liked those kinds of suits. If you look at the data on the people who know you best in your life, um, the people who know you best, it's not that they know what you like, it's that they know what you don't like. And the best example of that is, you know, um, moms and dads know a ton about what their kids like. And, you know, they say, well, he doesn't like the crusts on the thing, or he doesn't like that kind of ketchup, or whatever it might be. Whereas the people who know you casually, they don't know anything that you don't like. They only know what you like. So we thought, what an interesting uh, opportunity for an online environment where instead of constantly saying, we know what you like, we know what you like, we know what you like, what if a website also lets you know that it knows what you don't like? Would you then trust it more because it, you have a better feeling that it really gets you as a person and makes you feel like this thing understands me, I should buy or I should like the service more? So we call these um, rejection agents. And the idea is in an online dating environment, we tell you not just who you like, but we also tell you who you don't like. And we tell you, I understand who you don't like. And again, we see if that improves people's perceptions. And again, showing people this process by which the website is figuring you out makes people like the website more and they're more likely to trust the results. Now this is pretty counterintuitive because in general on a website, why would you show people the thing that they don't want, right? So if I search for green sweaters, the last thing you want to do is show me a bunch of red sweaters and say, I know you don't like these red sweaters. But by showing people that you know uh, they don't like red sweaters, part of the thing you're reminding, me, uh, reminding them of is, wow, if I went to a store, I would have had to look through all the red and green sweaters and it would have taken me a really long time. 
and then you thank the website for doing the search for you. You can imagine the effort yourself, and then you thank the website for taking that on for you, and that's partly what predicts why we really like these websites that show you what they rejected as a, and in addition to what they accepted. And again, very trivial changes. Again, in the end, it's the exact same output on the other end. It's green sweaters all the way down, but showing the process by which the website's working for you, again, makes people really like the service more. Um, okay, so we can also do this with static displays. So a lot of what we've done is some sort of dynamic uh, display where we show you work being done. Of course, in a lot of contexts in the world, it's difficult to have people watch some sort of uh, uh, animation while they're waiting for something. But it works actually pretty well with just showing people a picture of a process uh, also. So um, here is from a, a website uh, that we got data from that sells t-shirts. They actually show the process by which a t-shirt is made. So it goes from cotton, cutting, sewing, dyeing, finishing, transport. Now we kind of know that t-shirts start as cotton and then probably stuff has to happen and then they end up in a store. But just showing people that picture makes them like the t-shirt more because they like seeing the full process visualized. They now say, I'm okay paying a lot of money for a t-shirt. And even more surprisingly, we can do an even bigger kind of transparency where we actually show you how much it costs to make. So I know that's hard to read, but for example, the cotton was $2.75. Uh, the labor of sewing was 35 cents all the way down. It cost us 50 cents to ship it. And most companies would be horrified to ever show customers their cost structure. Because of course, at the end of that, what you do is you mark it up a lot to try to make a profit. And this company said, it's crazy. There's no way we should show the prices, because the cost of goods, because people will think we're ripping them off. Except it turns out that when people see all those costs, they really feel like the company's being honest and straightforward and transparent. And they like the company more. And it makes them more likely to buy a t-shirt rather than less likely to buy a t-shirt. So it seems risky to show everything. And this was one where even we wondered whether it would backfire. Even here, actually, this kind of transparency makes people like the service more and be more likely to buy. Okay, so, um, so far I've talked about, let's see, pizza, uh, online dating, searching for a flight, and now buying a t-shirt. What does this have to do with government? Uh, so the joke that I usually make um, when I'm talking to non-government audiences is this. So I say, look, we figured out how to make people buy pizza, and we found people a soulmate, but um, can anyone think of an organization that takes a huge amount of our money every year and um, sometimes we feel like we don't get anything in return? And in a regular audience, sadly, everyone shouts out government. Uh, because uh, in most countries, certainly in the United States, people feel as though their taxes go somewhere and what they get back is nothing at all or very uncertain rewards for paying their taxes. And we thought this is an interesting case where perhaps, because we know, and you know, government actually does quite a bit of work. Could we visualize that work and change people's perceptions of how much government does? There's a um, terrific book called The Submerged State by a political scientist named, named Suzanne Mettler um, that's really a fascinating book. But among the many interesting things in this book uh, is this table that I love. Uh, so a little bit hard to read again, but. Uh, table three is the percentage of program beneficiaries who report that they, quote, have not used a government social program, end quote. And then on the side here are the government social programs that these respondents have used. And that column is the percent of people who are using that government social program who say, no, I have never used a government social program. And the numbers are staggering. I'll just show you a few examples because it's easier to read. Half of Americans who receive student loans for education, which is a massively federally subsidized activity, half of the people who are using that government social program in the United States say, I have never used a government social program even once in my life. Look at the GI Bill. Veterans returning from the military who get assistance to go to school, 40% of them say, I've never used a government social program, even while they're enrolled in a government social program. And Medicare, 40% of Americans who are using government health care say, I've never used a government social program. It's a huge, huge problem. And the percents are all extraordinarily high. Now, you could say, well, people are just stupid and they don't know what's going on. 
Or I think the point of, of her book and what we focused on is um, the links are very unclear to the everyday services we get and the idea that government is providing them. Because when you get a student loan, it's not as though the government comes to your house and says, we're the government, here's your loan. You're through an intermediary. So you never quite know that in the end it's government that's helping you. So, so many problems uh, that, that government tries to solve are things that they happen below the surface and we never see them. And the analogy that I use here uh, to the real world is your parents. So um, the, way that this, the way that people work with government is you drive for hours and hours and hours on a road, perfectly smooth roads, wonderful ride. And then after hours and hours and hours of wonderful driving, you hit one pothole and you say, this is typical. This is what I'm talking about. Government doesn't do anything well. There's potholes everywhere. Except you just drove for hours and hours on great roads and there were no potholes, but we completely forget those. And the analogy that I use is with parents. So when you're a little kid, your parents are supposed to pick you up on time every time. They should never be late to pick you up even once. So hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times, your parents pick you up exactly on time. And then one day comes when they're 15 minutes late. And for the rest of your life, <laughs> you're in therapy dealing with the fact that your parents abandoned you. And you never get over it. It's a little bit that way with government. There's no credit for all the good stuff. There's only the downside of all the bad stuff. So we wondered, are there things that we could surface where people would appreciate a little bit more what government does? And I'll show you a couple of examples of what we've done here. And the first one we started with actually was potholes. Uh, the, the experiment that we did with the city of Boston uh, in Massachusetts, where, where I work, um, this is a map of the city of Boston. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, they developed this new app called the Daily Brief, which now you have an app like this here. We, we chatted about it yesterday, where if you see a pothole or a street sign missing or a traffic light that's out, you can take a picture of it and text it to this website. And then the website will track that service request. And you can actually go on and track your service request. And you can look at other people's service requests as well. So you get full information on what's happening in the city of Boston. So we did an experiment to figure out, well, what does this do to change people's perceptions of government? How should we design this site? What kind of transparency should we use to change people's perceptions that government's doing a good job? So this is, in a sense, the control treatment, where all we're showing you here is a map of the city. And you can see at the bottom a couple of numbers. So on the left, is, it says open. 8,845, that's the total number of open service requests in the city of Boston. Next to it is opened yesterday, 64, which means 64 people yesterday took a picture and sent it in. And closed yesterday is 90. Yesterday, 90 service requests the city took care of and closed them. So yesterday was a good day, in a sense, for the city because they closed more than were opened. So we show some people just this, and we ask them a bunch of questions about government. Think how you might react to seeing this particular page. Does it change your opinion of government or does it not change your opinion of government? But then other people, we gave them a different version where we tried to increase the transparency and increase how interesting this was to look at. And that looked like this. So same data as before, really. The numbers haven't changed. But now what we're doing is we're showing you these toggles of what was opened yesterday. And we're showing you the other toggles of what was closed yesterday. And you can actually take your mouse and hover over them. And they'll blow up and they'll say, well, this is a pothole over on that street. Uh, now, actually, not at the time, but now, what happens when a service request is closed, the work, work crew takes a picture of the fixed pothole. And that uploads, too. So you can actually see pre-post on the website. People really like it a lot. People will surf around here for a while to see what's going on and what's up. What we find, so think about these two versions again. One of them, we tell you the city now has a website and we're tracking the total number of requests. And then the other, we show you a little bit more about the process that's going on. Then we ask people, how do you feel about government? Well, it turns out that when people see this compared to the previous one, a bunch of things change. Uh, so they, when they see the transparency, they, they agree that uh, government should be larger which is really hard to get Americans to say. Uh, they think the government's doing a better job. And my favorite one is they think government does a better job than it's given credit for. That's a big one because Americans in particular say government does nothing and deserves no credit for anything. 
And this small visualization that we try here can bump people's attitudes on, that, on these metrics to get them to say, you know what, I trust government a little bit more. I do think they're doing a good job. Now, the, the um, curious among you might be thinking that we didn't visualize everything that we could have. So remember that 8,845 number? Let me show you what it looks like when we visualize that as well. Remember, that's the total number of open requests in the entire city of Boston. <laughs> it looks like that. Uh, it doesn't look great. Remember those great blue ones? Yeah, it's hard to see those now. It just looks like basically the city's bright red. Uh, in fairness to the city of Boston, some of the red requests are things like um, people will take a picture of a highway and say, I think this should be a park. <laughs> so it's a little hard for the city to close that request in a day or two uh, or ever when citizens do that. But here's what's fascinating. So remember when I said, you know, showing the cost structure of a product feels like a terrible idea and it would really hurt us? This is kind of the version of that for government, showing people the fact that there are so many open requests. Surely this actually is worse than telling them nothing at all. We didn't know. I mean, this, in a sense, is a test for us to say, how transparent should we really be when we're showing this data? And what's so interesting is that even when we show this, it's still not worse than saying nothing. And sometimes it's still better than saying nothing. And the reason for that, and I'm, I'm sad to say that this is the reason, is because people are shocked that government is doing anything. So the fact that there's a website that is maintained by government that keeps track of things, that alone makes many people say, wow, government's great. And then they say, well, there's a lot of red, so it's not that great. But at least I have some sense of what's going on in government. Because when, before this website, you, know, you call in a service request, and you never know what happened. You don't even know if anybody logged it, and you never know when your thing's gonna be filled or completed or anything. At least here, you know that government is at work. Are they doing the best perfect job in the world? No, because there's a lot of red there, but they've got some sort of system and they're categorizing things and, and so on. So even this version that's bright red still sometimes helps perceptions compared to just saying nothing, because again, the transparency gives people the feeling that government is working, not perfectly, but working for them. Now we're working on a version actually where you can, when you text in your service request, you can look to see when it's sequenced to happen. So one of the ideas is, you know, you say I have a pothole and I'm mad about it, and then you text it in, and you would expect six minutes later the work crew to come and fill it, because now you've told government there's a problem, and government's supposed to run over and solve the problem. So how do we get people to be interested in telling us, uh, thank you, interested in telling us that there's a problem, but able to wait a few weeks for it to be fixed. Well, we can actually be transparent about the work crew. So we can say it's work crew 19 that's scheduled for your pothole. Here's the four things they have to do before they get to you. Now, people still are impatient and they'd rather the work crew came right away, but at least now they understand why there might be a delay and it might make them a little more patient. The version that we really want to try, but we haven't yet, but um, we hope to do it with the city of Boston, is not only do you have the work crew's work schedule, but you have a picture of them, like the guys <laughs> with their arms hanging like this, so that you even know the people who are coming. And the reason that we think this will be very effective is, remember the locksmith guy with the sweat on the thing? Now it's not just some government bureaucracy website. Now it's those guys. And those guys have to do other stuff. I, I get it. They've got to fill the thing on the other street. And then over, after a while, they're going to come to my street and fill it. It shouldn't make any difference, right? The pothole's still not filled. But our sense is that by showing people the inner workings, they'll be a lot happier with it. So I just have a couple of minutes left. So I just want to share a couple of other um, projects that we're working on, uh, in fact, that we'd love to do more tests on. So I'm happy to chat about this after. The next one is this idea of um, when uh, President Obama was elected, uh, in 2008, he said he's going to release a tax receipt to every American. And the way that this works is you can enter in how much tax you paid last year, and you get a tax receipt that says, based on the percent of the budget that goes to various uh, categories, here's where your money went. So you can see that most of your money goes to Social Security and Medicaid. A huge chunk of it goes to interest on the national debt. So in fact, the idea was this sort of transparency would make people happy. In fact, what we find is that it mainly makes people angry because there's at least one category where they're really mad that that's happening. So what do we do instead? How do we increase transparency? We've done experiments where we tell people, um, you could allocate 10% of your taxes 
where you want it to go. Not 100%, because we'd have probably anarchy, but 10% of the tax you pay, you're allowed to tell us where it goes. And we find when people do that, they're much happier with their taxes. Tax satisfaction goes up, and in laboratory experiments, are actually less likely to cheat on their taxes and steal money when we allow them to have a little bit of say. Even, in fact, when we just say, we're interested in your opinion on where your taxes should go, will you tell us by dragging slider bars how much money you think should go to different categories? Even just getting people's opinion about where the money should go can improve their perceptions of taxes because at least someone's asking them something about all of this money that's leaving them. That's uh, number one. Very related idea is uh, with parking tickets. So we're hoping to launch this actually in a small city in the US. You get a parking ticket right now, even if you stopped in the middle of the highway and got out of your car and left it there, and you come back and find a parking ticket, it's very unfair. <laughs> Everyone feels every parking ticket they ever got is truly unjust. So how do we get people to feel a little bit better about their parking tickets? Well, rather than the back saying, you owe us a huge amount of money, pay it, the back will say, um, you owe us a huge amount of money and you have to pay it. Here's three categories where your uh, parking ticket might be used. And it could be, for example, on roads or on a park or on something else. Tell us where you want the money to go. And the idea is, would you send in your fee when we told you you have some say in it? We haven't run the trial yet, but my sense is yes, because again, we're letting you into government, being transparent about where the money is going, and giving you a little bit of say. And then um, the very last thing that I'll talk about is a, br a brand new project on social recycling. Um, this is a, a very cool idea, actually, that comes from the Netherlands. That's a, that bag says Godzak, which means good bag. And the way that it works is in the Netherlands, this is actually just a pilot in one town. You have trash and you have recycling and then you have social recycling. And social recycling is stuff that you don't need anymore but somebody else might need. And the idea is that by separating things into those categories, you change the trash experience. And instead of it being there's trash and recycling and government's making me do this and I'm mad about it, now it's trash recycling and I'm able to give to other people. One way it can work is everyone in the neighborhood can look in the bags and take stuff they want, so it's kind of bartering. And another way is all of that stuff goes to charity and the city picks it up and takes it to a charity. And what we're trying to do here is give people a voice, in, even in something as trivial as their trash. We're trying to let people into the process of trash, let them have more say over where their stuff goes, and ideally actually uh, change the way that they uh, sort trash recycling and social recycling. And in the laboratory experiments we've done, we find, first off, people really like to do this when they have a social recycling option. It makes them feel really good. And they get better at sorting trash and recycling, too. So not only do they put stuff in the social recycling thing, but it makes them approach the task with more care. And they end up getting better at putting the recycling stuff where it belongs and the trash stuff where it belongs. That's the last example I'll talk about, because the idea of letting people in is very broad in a sense. So, so parking tickets are very different than taxes, are very different than trash. But the general concept, which I've shown you in lots of domains of this transparency, it really resonates with citizens. Even a little bit of transparency really resonates. So we're constantly looking for new domains where we can add more transparency to, transparency to some process to really improve uh, people's perceptions. So final thing, if you think about something that you're working on, uh, the way to think about it is, so every organization, whether it's a for-profit, non-profit, government agency, feels as though it's doing a ton of stuff for its customers or employees or citizens that they're not getting credit for. You know, we, we do all of these amazing things and all they do is complain. And the idea here is it's incumbent upon you to show that stuff. Because if people can't see it, how can they give you credit for it? So thinking about a process or a service that you provide that people aren't aware of, Think about that and how you would then show that. What's the picture or the short animation where citizens can see what's being done for them? And hopefully then that's going to change their perceptions of you and of government uh, more generally. And with that, I will stop. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Hazel. And a very warm welcome to everyone today. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Michael very much for that very interesting lecture. It's a very important message that he has for us. And I've just a few um, interesting points, and I think we were all laughing quite a lot during his session. And I think um, part of that reason is because we recognize the truth of what he was saying. We recognized a bit of ourselves in what he was saying. 
Um, and a few things that to take note of. This first point was really operational transparency or showing people what we are doing. That can go a long way towards uh, improving the trust we have in that experience as well as our valuation of those experiences. Um, the second is that we often feel better or more appreciative when we know that people are working hard for us, and that's an interesting observation. And the third was also uh, it's important how we achieve that transparency. So uh, show, don't tell, don't brag. Um, make things visible and um, let people have a say in things. So all, all very interesting messages and I'm very interested to hear um, questions. So without further ado, I'll open the time to the audience, please. Um, ruin the whole experience of showing what you're doing to make a technical mistake of it. Yeah, so the uh, question is um, what happens? So, w we've talked about cases where when you show the work being done, the work being done is pretty good. But what about cases where if you show the work being done, the work being done is really bad? So, someone's making a pizza for you and you ordered a vegetarian pizza and you see the process and they're throwing pepperoni and sausage on, onto your pizza. Are you still happy to see the process uh, going on? Um, the, an the short answer is yes and no. So we did do a, a funny experiment, well, we thought it was funny, experiment with online dating, where we uh, showed you the website working really, really hard, you know, searching through everyone in the entire city and everything like that. And then we deliberately gave you results that were really bad. And the way they were really bad is everyone was really funny looking. <laughs> and the question is, when something works really hard for you and then gives you something that's not great, do you still like it? And the answer is no, actually. So there's a, there is a boundary on if you do a lot of work for someone and then the outcome is bad, it's actually better to not have done the work and make the outcome bad. Because the inference is you did all of that work <laughs> and that's the best you could do. Whereas if I give it to you right away, you don't like it, but you still feel like, well, maybe they just didn't try. So yes, very often, in fact, it's important that the work be at least mediocre, let's say, or better. But it depends on where people's reference point is. So when I showed you the bright red map of the city of Boston with all of the toggles on it, in a way, that's someone who's making your pizza wrong because they're, they're not closing every project. And you might expect people to say, now I dislike government even more. But when your expectation or your reference point is low enough, unfortunately as it is with government in the US, it still can be better to show that at least you're trying than to show nothing at all. So it, it's very sort of context specific when and why it's okay to show different levels of performance. And that's something that in every domain that we explore, we have to learn that and then adjust our interventions accordingly. Thank you. Uh, how much of uh, what you observe is actually a novelty effect? So having observed the same workings many, many times repeatedly, does the impact wear off after, this, after some time? Yeah, it's a great question. Actually, it's a question that applies to um, any intervention that we try in a sense, which is maybe we can capture people's attention today, maybe tomorrow, and then it sort of becomes business as usual and fades into the background and who cares anymore. Um, we do tend to see that, as with most things, these sorts of effects do wear off over time. And one of the ways, so one thing you can say is, well, that just means it's going to wear off over time. But the other thing that we can play with is, well, let's change the visualization. So it doesn't have to be exactly the same every time to show you the process. We can change the way the process looks. We're still giving you the same information, but we're making it kind of more interesting or different over time. And we can actually recapture people's attention. So with the, uh, uh, sorry to return to online dating, but with the online dating example, we had people try the basic version and they really liked it. And then they got a bit tired of it. And that's when we introduced the exploding faces aspect. So it was the same information actually that we're searching through things for you and here's the process. But we were able to add elements that made it more interesting again and keep engagement up. So we are constantly fighting against any intervention that we try will sort of become less effective over time. And then we need to think really in a design principle way, what are ways to make it interesting for people again so that they'll uh, stick with us. And unfortunately, it's again very domain specific. So there aren't 
you know, three principles of reinvigoration because it really is what context are we working in, why are people getting tired of it, and then we can think about how to bump people back up and be interested again. Uh, Arndt Huzar from the UNDP Global Center for Public Service Excellence. Um, we work a lot with uh, governments trying to improve their public services and what we are looking at mostly is the side of the public officials themselves. Now in your example from Boston, I'm wondering whether it did anything to the motivation of public officials um, to work bet better and to perform better in response to these uh, transparency measures. So you're wondering about sort of the feedback loop on if we show transparency, then the people who are being made transparent work yes. harder? Yes, if that is the case, yeah. or if it did the opposite. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's a great question also. Um, we haven't done that experiment with public service officials, but we have done it with um, a completely different group of people, which is chefs. So uh, imagine uh, you can, now it's very common where you can see chefs working uh, and it turns out that actually the, the research that we took over some cafeterias and did experiments, it turns out that we like our food better when we can see the chef working. Uh, in part, it's the same, we like to see people working for us. We love to see a chef working hard and then the food tastes better for us. But what's interesting is we can actually separate the effect of me seeing the chef from the chef seeing me. So it turns out that the transparency, knowing that uh, someone's going to see your work, actually in this case makes chefs work harder and better. And s being able to see people enjoy the food makes them like it even more, makes them try even harder. So in these cases we do have actually both sides end up doing better and enjoying the experience more. I'll say with government it's much more complicated than that. So for example, I told you that what we'd like to do is have the work crews on potholes. We'd like to have their schedule uh, listed for people to see. And one of the things we thought about was actually we'd have GPS, uh, like with the Domino's driver, so you can actually see where your work crew was. Uh, it turns out uh, that there are these, these things, maybe you've heard of them called unions. Uh, and unions were not super excited about letting any citizen who wanted monitor their employees as they did work. So uh, there is a pushback for sure on the other side of transparency, which is, when government is transparent, it allows citizens to monitor. And not all uh, people in government would like to be monitored uh, to that extent. So we are often trying to find a middle ground on the transparency that the government agency is comfortable with that's still fully accurate so that when citizens see it, they're getting real and true information. And hopefully we visualize it in a way that changes um, their attitudes for the better. But it's, it is a very fine line that we often have to cope with. The other example that people often use is, um, do you want to see inside of a hot dog factory? Uh, no. no, exactly. So not all processes are good to uh, visualize and not all organizations are excited about the process of visualization. There's often that other angle that comes into play. One of the most fascinating conversations in a long time. Thank you, Michael. A um, few comments and just see whether you can give me some feed flow. That's a new term today. You heard it here first. Feedback is an old term. To be feed flow, it's actually a continuous virtuous loop. What you explained earlier about the chef and all that, right? Um, what you told me this afternoon, in some way, quite affirmed by some of my guesses earlier as an architect. You're absolutely right about good is not good enough, but showing that you are good is the way to go. Right? Uh, we as architects always make the fundamental error. We will do all the hard work and go and show the best piece of work to the client and get rubbish from them. Uh, the better one, the more skillful one always show rubbish first, and then they take them through the road of how they clean up the design, and then they get very good approval. That happens in school as well, right? So we used to do this trick sometimes with some of the professor. We show them all the rubbish first until they get completely annoyed. And uh, one, two days later, we improve a little bit, but actually we were there already. But you never show the last one because you always get rubbish from them. So you show the rubbish, get them all confused. 
then you show that development, right? Even though you know the answer already three weeks ago. So, so I think the idea of showing that it's a very transformative thing. Uh, your trust and your transparency will actually trigger the mind. And that's where I think Steve Jobs is clever, the man in the machine. You are not allowed them to consume your produce or your provision or whatever, your service or whatever it is. You are actually inviting them to consume through their imagination. That's very clever, I thought. Because a lot of things is here, they remember for life, you know, and it kicks in and it makes that impactful message. Huh? And I think you're right that, again, Steve Jobs is very clever, you see. He never give you the best product. He give you the best product for today, right? Then there's iPhone 4, 5, 6, 6S or 7, I don't know what it is, 6S or 7, but that's how you bring people along with your imagination, right? So, so I think uh, what you're saying, there's a lot of lessons we can learn from you today, you know, in terms of improving that communication and the fee flow between the provider and the consumer. That's great. Thank you very much. I think uh, I have a friend who's um, an artist, and w one of the things that she does whenever someone comes into her gallery is she um, quickly changes into paint-spattered clothes uh, and even puts some fresh paint on that's still wet so that people have the feeling that she's really working hard right then. And her, her theory, we've never actually done an experiment, but her theory is that just in the arts in particular, actually, that, that showing that you work hard on a piece of work. Again, the, the artwork is the artwork, but the feeling that the artist put a lot of work into it actually really, I think, can change people's perception. You really do see it's, it's so interesting. For us, it's a very fun domain of research because it applies in so many domains of life. We're now actually working with a consulting firm. So think about this. You have coworkers at work who you feel do not appreciate all of the hard work you put in. Has this ever happened to you? <laughs> Probably. We all feel chronically underappreciated by, you know, I did all this work and all the guy said was thanks. So one of the things you can think about is how do you visualize all the work that you've been doing? It's not easy to do, but one of the things that uh, we can work with is a, um, basically a very simple program that kind of shows the amount of time that people have put into different projects. And then what you do is you get, you don't have to say, hey, I worked really hard. It's just embedded in the workflow that everyone can see how much work you did. And we find that not only are people better at giving credit where credit's due, but everyone's happier because they feel that their work is being shown to other people. And even if they don't get a thank you, they still feel in their minds that it's fair now, that everything they're doing is being honored and recognized by somebody else. And that alone is enough to increase their satisfaction with their teams. So ju just to say there's so many domains in which showing work can be really psychologically impactful. Professor, you have shared a lot of examples of uh, products or services that have already been thought through and completed, and then you make that process transparent to the end user. Uh, in this day and age, I think, at least in the Singapore Public Service, there's a lot of experimentation going on. You know, a lot of prototyping of services and all that. What are your views in terms of transparency for such types of services? Because they are real, they are happening. Uh, are there things to look out for uh, in terms of being transparent in such uh, activities? You mean transparent in the fact that you are experimenting? Yes. Got it. Um, that's a very tricky question. So you may have heard uh, in the US uh, a big uh, scandal happened with Facebook, where Facebook uh, ran an experiment on its own users where they manipulated um, how positive and negative your newsfeed was. So they were trying to see if they could affect people's mood over time by, you know, you get, there's many, many things that could appear in your newsfeed. And usually what happens is they just appear, in a sense, randomly. What they did for some people was they filtered them so they got to see lots of their friends and people saying happy stuff, and other people got lots of their friends saying sad stuff. And it turns out it does affect users' moods in exactly the way you think, which is if you see happy stuff, you're happier, and if you see sad stuff, you're less sad. Uh, you, if you see sad stuff, you're sadder. Now, they got in a lot of trouble because it seems very problematic for a company to try to make people sad. Now, companies do try to make us sad all the time. So they show us sad advertising and we cry because the mom hugs the kid or something and then they say, also buy this toilet paper. 
So we're often okay with companies making us sad, but this one felt um, a bit sneaky because they sort of were doing it like this, but in particular people were upset that it was an experiment. So imagine if they'd only done let's make people happy and everyone got that. People probably would have been okay with that. It was the idea that they got some people happier and some people sadder. That feels differently problematic because now they're sort of deciding who has a good week and who doesn't. So we do think a lot about when we run experiments, um, how transparent should we be as it's running and then how transparent should we be after it's over to let people know what we were doing. It's hard with experiments because if you're fully transparent as an experiment is happening, you can't have some people have version one and some people have version two because if they know both, we can't test them cleanly. But we do always try to make sure that after the fact, people understand what we were trying to do. But most importantly, we're always trying to do experiments where we have a control condition that's kind of the way it is now. And any other thing that we try, we're trying to improve outcomes for people. In other words, we're never trying to have the let's make people sadder treatment in our experiments. We're trying to have the let's improve people's outcomes. So we're thinking, you know, um, one of the things that we work a lot on is volunteering, uh, trying to get people to volunteer more. And the reason that we work so much on volunteering is because um, nearly every organization would like its employees or its citizens to volunteer more because it's great for the organization. But we also know from our own research that when you volunteer, it improves your well-being. So these are interventions where when we run them, we have people aren't volunteering very much, and we try to increase the extent to which people volunteer. And what we know is the organization will benefit because more people are volunteering, but we also know that anyone who we induce to volunteer will end up being a happier person. And then we're very excited about running interventions like that because it's a win for everyone involved, and we're not making any trade-offs where we're wanting to learn something interesting, but perhaps we're making people slightly worse off. That's, different researchers have a different take on your question, but that's sort of how I and the people that I work with approach that problem. Thank you. Uh, Professor Norton, just actually a more general question. You show a lot of work that you and your colleagues at the business school have done. What are you trying to achieve with all of this? What am I trying to achieve in my life, you mean? <laughs> Got it. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that uh, question. Um, uh, so I'm a social psychologist by training, which means I'm trained to do experiments on people, which is a really weird job if you think about it, because it, I always make this motion of you're sort of pulling the strings on people and seeing what they do. Another way to describe it is you're messing with people and seeing if you can change their behavior. So I find that interesting, period. Uh, another way to think about the social psychology is um, you're trying to figure out why your friends are so weird. <laughs> you know, why do people behave in this way under these circumstances? It's very often very confusing why people behave the way they do. The other way to think about it is why do I do all the crazy things that I do all the time that I know I shouldn't? In any case, we can study those. We can try to understand what really makes people tick, what really influences their behavior. And the best way to do that is through experiments, is to say, let's have these people experience this version of the world for an hour, and let's have these people experience this version of the world for an hour, and let's see how their behavior changes. Now, you can use that mindset to do anything you want. So you could use that mindset to get people to smoke more if you wanted to, but what we try to do in our research and what I try to do in mine is, is improve people's well-being when we can. So a huge chunk of my research actually is on interventions to make people happier. So we do lots of interventions where we encourage people to volunteer more, to give to charity more, to spend more time with friends and family, to have a better work-life balance. We try to figure out ways to help people manage that. And in the end, the goal is we still get to figure out what makes people tick, which is just inherently interesting. But maybe along the way, we improve people's outcomes, in which case we also did something a little bit nice as we got to pursue our own theories about what makes people tick. So ideally it goes both ways where um, the people that we work with, whether it's government or organizations, um, their stakeholders end up happier and better off, and we learn something interesting about human behavior along the way. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> uh, professor, 
I'm Han Jin from uh, Center of Livable Cities. I just, the sharing is very interesting, but I just want to know, have you ever studied the effects of transparency on uh, developing countries versus developed countries? If not, what's your take on it? Can you give me an example of, of how you think it would, it's a great question, how you think it would be different? Like, for example, uh, you implementing this kind of transparency in a government service in Singapore versus what was the reaction of the, the citizens like compared to citizens of uh, implementing this in India? Yeah, so and in fact, this relates to the question of are you visualizing things that are going well? Or are you visualizing things that aren't going well? So developing countries, of course, struggle much more with service delivery than developed countries. Um, we have not done that research, uh, in, in part because um, with governments, there's really only still a few governments in the world that are very tuned into doing this kind of research. Uh, one of them is here, of course. That's why I and other people have been here. Uh, but it's very few. If you think about it, the UK, the Netherlands, the United States, uh, Canada, Australia, that's about it. Uh, so uh, developed countries are the ones who have been running these kinds of interventions. We would love to do interventions in other countries, of course, to see what we can learn, um, but the uptake has been a little bit slower. There's lots of research through NGOs in developing countries on sort of getting people, you know, medical compliance and things like that. There's less on these sorts of issues that we've been talking about today. I think it's a huge uh, opportunity going forward in the future to test these same things in different environments and see where the psychology is the same and where the psychology is quite different. Thanks. Um, over at the back, please, um, the lady. Hi, thank you, Professor. Um, um, I, I have a question regarding uh, the whole work process concerning the government. Very often it involves decision making within different tiers in the government. So when one, say a citizen applies for some service, there's some decision making involved within the diff different tiers of government. So what is your advice to the government to make this more transparent without um, uh, uh, attributing any, say, rejections to any certain department? And uh, also, uh, there's also uh, uh, an encouragement for different government agencies to work together as a whole of government approach. So where it concerns different agencies uh, deliberating on certain issues, how do you make that more transparent? Yeah, that, that's a, a really interesting problem uh, to solve. We actually um, talked yesterday a little bit about um, when people appeal some decision uh, to government, uh, you know, whatever you appeal, it turns out it's not just something that one person decides. Usually many different people have to chime in to say your appeal is approved or denied. But of course, what people want is an answer immediately. Whenever they appeal anything to government or whenever they ask government a question, they want an answer right now. And so we actually thought about trying to visualize the process by which decisions are made. So you could think about showing people a flowchart of who needs to view this information before we can make a decision, and helping people in that way have more realistic expectations for how long things will take. That very rarely is the case. So usually what happens is you contact government, and often you hear nothing. You might go to a website where if you check it, it says your, your thing is in progress. But there's no other information about what stage it's at, or where it is, or when it's going to be over. And we thought, actually, about trying to visualize that entire process, so you can think about um, not only these are the steps that have to happen when we're searching for something, but these are the people who are involved in this process to also make people understand that better. And we have shown, actually, that people really like to understand who is involved in a process. Not just what the process is, but which people are involved. We did an experiment, this is not in the domain of government, but we did an experiment with a newspaper where, so um, people, all, everyone thinks that all online media should be free. And uh, newspapers don't necessarily agree because they have a huge amount of staff and they have to pay them. So the question is, how can we get people who are used to getting news for free online to understand more that maybe a newspaper has costs and maybe they should pay them a little bit of money? And the way that we did it was, so we, asked, we showed people a news article that says, you know, here's the article and here's the person who wrote it. And we said, how many people do you think are involved in the production of this newspaper article? And they said, one the person who wrote it. 
which means that they think basically some guy just typed it and then they put it right online and nothing else had to happen. So instead what we did was we showed them all the people who were involved in producing that piece of writing, which was quite short, including, for example, the fact that there has to be a website and someone had to make the website and maintain the website. And when we reminded people, or someone copy edits and someone has to make the art for the piece, all of these other people who are involved in producing this piece, when we showed people an interesting picture of how the piece came about, they were more willing to say, maybe I should pay for the newspaper. So we do think a lot about the, not just the processes involved, but the people involved and how best to, and again, we want to make it simple and compelling rather than a very complicated chart, how best to show people those processes happening and who is involved in order to move them toward, I, I really like the output of this service. It's, it gets complicated quickly as your question is highlighting, but I think there are ways to do it in a way that is fairly quickly understandable for people. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Uh, on the point of sustained impact, I was wondering whether uh, have you guys studied further on the point of uh, on the example of the daily brief in Boston? Has the sustained impact in terms of the improved perception of the government actually le uh, lead to say a spike in the kind of demands on the government, perhaps even fostering a sense of entitlement? Yeah. So this is a, it's a great question. It's a huge issue, and it comes up a lot. Which is if we show people. Will they then just demand more and more and more? Because now we've shown them what we're doing, and now they'll say, well, do twice as much, do three times as much. And we run into this actually with that website. And because imagine that you text in a pothole, and then it gets fixed. And then you go on a rampage <laughs> all over the city <laughs> and take pictures of five million things that need to be fixed. Well, what do we do now? Uh, it turns out, so remember the, the um, again, the picture that was bright red with all the dots? In a sense, that's, that is that scenario where what people are saying is fix everything. Everything's broken, fix everything. And we do find that it doesn't seem to make people feel that everything should be done right away. In other words, they're still grateful for the transparency and it doesn't seem to shift their expectations that everything should instantly be fixed. If anything, it helps them understand that things take time. Now that's not a strong effect in the data, so I can't say that very confidently. But we don't kind of see, the, at least in, in Boston, the negative downside that you're talking about, where what it will do is make people want more and more and more. But I can see how, if it's not managed correctly, it could lead to that. So then again, we have to think about what do we make transparent and when, and how do we communicate to people what's being done and what's not being done. One of the other things, by the way, it's only a little bit related to your question, that we can do with these sorts of websites is we can figure out problem areas in general. So um, it's often the case that many people report the same pothole. You know, there's a pothole on a pretty busy road and lots of people say there's a pothole, there's a pothole. Whereas another pothole is on a side street that people don't use very much and only one person reports it. So the other thing that this app allows us to do is actually prioritize problems in a way that we really can't otherwise because we don't really know who's bothered by what. And so there's a sense in which these things can aggregate up and we can also start to see a little bit better, like maybe this whole street just needs to be redone because we're getting lots of pictures from this exact street all over the street. And we could do that ourselves. We could drive around the city, of course, and see which streets need to be repaired. But this is a way to do it for free, in a sense. And then what we have is we can say, let's not fix these potholes, let's do this whole street. And then we're solving many, people problem, many people's problems at once instead of one-offing each of them. So we're hoping in some ways that when we aggregate up to more data, some efficiencies will come out of it. But m many, let me say many people have said exactly what you've said, which is this real concern that what we're doing is opening a crazy box of people demanding everything right away. And we do need to think more and test more how to manage that possibility. Thanks. Sorry, one follow-up. Um, has what you've been doing in the digital world through email, websites, and so on, has it been reflected in the, in the physical environment, i.e., has the city of Boston, for example, embraced this fully and put up uh, you know, a sign, this pothole has been fixed today for you in the reality, so that 
people who are not plugged into digital services, I presume a lot of people, users who, who actually have the most difficulty with situations in the physical environment, uh, that they would realize what the city is doing. Has there been discussions about how behavioral economics could be um, applied in, in those fields as well, in the physical space? Um, y yes and no. So um, there's a very fine line between showing the work you're doing and telling people that you did work. I mentioned that earlier, um, uh, where if you tell people, here's all the stuff I did for you, it just makes them dislike you. And putting up signs that say we did a good thing is moving a bit toward the telling you that we did stuff for you. Whereas online, when you're just checking stuff, in a sense, the online environment just feels like the city's keeping it updated. So they're not saying that that project is closed to brag. They're saying it's closed because it's closed, and that's how the website works. But when you put a flag there that says, we fixed this, it's very clear that all you want is credit, because that's extra work and extra money to put the sign there. Do you know what I mean? So we want to move in that direction, because we do want more people to appreciate what's being done. But we have to be very careful that we don't cross the line into, we're great, and you should stop complaining, as opposed to, we're doing a lot of work, and we'd like you to see the work that we're doing. And those are, again, tensions that we haven't quite um, resolved, because you do want to get as the most credit that you can, but you need to do it in a way that's credible, that doesn't rub people the wrong way. Uh, and we, we're still struggling a little bit with, with how to do that. And we're a couple of projects along those lines um, in the early works now. Good afternoon, Professor. Uh, my name is Jonathan from PUB. Um, in your examples, it's always where you have a situation where there's less transparency, and then it goes to a situation where there's more transparency. Have you ever done an experiment where you go from a situation where less transparency, more transparency, and then back down, you take away the transparency? How does it work? Because in some cases, there may be some information that we have provided uh, to give more transparency, but now, it has become sensitive and we need to take it back. Yeah. Or you can't provide it anymore in the future. Yeah. W uh, what's your guess? It goes worse. That means a lot lower than what you started with. Uh, that's often the case. Yeah, your intuition's right. So when you, because the reason that transparency works is that it's, um, it is honest. So you're saying basically, uh, we trust you and we're going to show you what we're doing. And it's very hard after that to back away and say, now you can't see it anymore. So imagine I, uh, so I'm, I'm married uh, and my wife has all my passwords and things. And so she, can, she doesn't, but she could look at whatever she wants in my email or something like that because we're very transparent. What if I called her and said, actually, you can't have my passwords anymore. I don't want you to read my email. It's worse than if I, ever, if I never gave her the thing to begin with because now it's a signal that something's wrong and I'm trying to hide something. So it is absolutely, when you, when you are transparent, you do open, you must be transparent from now on or people will actually have a more negative reaction. So it's a big decision to make in a sense that you are saying, um, this is who we are and we're going to keep being this way. We've done other things, um, for example, when we let people, um, I mentioned with parking tickets, you know, where do you want the money to go? We do other experiments where we let people do little micro votes on various things. Like in a retailer, we're gonna give money to charity, which charity should we give it to? And we get to vote. And consumers really like it, they get really into it, they love voting for which charity. The problem is if next week we say, well, um, that voting thing was just a one-time thing and now we're gonna decide again, it's worse than if we never let you vote at all. Because now people expect, they say, I thought we were in this together, I thought you were letting me into the process and we were working together, and now you're telling me, well, no, that was just a gimmick and now we're gonna go back to business as usual. That, as your intuition is, it's worse than never letting people into the process at all. So yeah, there is, um, I don't know if it's a downside exactly, but it is a commitment to be transparent that's very hard to then go back on uh, after you've already started to open up that conversation. Sorry, when you guys were looking into these, did you ever consider the, the transaction costs? Like at some point, it's not worth it to be transparent anymore, right? So did you guys look at that aspect? 
In, in what sense is it not worth it? For example, with Domino's, you know, someone needs to go and click, okay, your, you know, it's being, your pizza's being, being baked. Your pizza has the, you know, it's, it's getting the toppings on it, and you're going through that whole process. So that's going to cost some money. Did you guys ever look at that as, as a transaction cost? And, and uh, you know, what, what kind of impact? Like, when does it become... Uh, when does it become less of a, of a when, when does it, what, what, what's the tipping point where it, where it doesn't matter anymore or yeah. it, it's not worth it anymore? Yeah, great. It's a great question. So um, our favorite thing to do is simply visualize a process where um, uh, all the data is already there. And all we're doing is just pulling from something and showing it. So with travel websites, search engines are doing what we're showing. So no one needs to do any extra work. All we need to do is write a little program that visualizes the search. So those are, in a sense, maybe it takes someone a day to make the visualization, but that's it. And then it's, it's free from then on. So those are just win-wins because they're very cheap to implement. Then the other end of the spectrum is someone needs to start inputting this data manually. And then we're taking staff from somewhere else and putting them on this, and then that has a cost to us. Uh, and the trade-off that we make there is you know, you're, you've hired staff to improve customer service. So that person could be helping make pizzas, or they could be the one who's monitoring the pizzas and clicking, now it's being baked. And in the end, the experiment is, that does cost money. What is better at improving customer satisfaction? So what is the return on investment for having someone responsible for that versus having them help with the pizza? And it turns out that people like the transparency so much that very often, the co even when there are costs over here, it's actually outweighed by the benefits over here. But um, there are certainly cases in the world where it would be too much work to visualize what's happening over here. You know, it would require too much manpower or too much programming, in which case we'd have to rethink what we're doing over here. But the last thing I'll say in answer to that question is, the best thing to do is this kind of visualization where things are happening and it looks really cool. But even static pictures of a process, remember the shirt that I showed you? That's not a dynamic thing where when it's being cut, it lights up, and when it's being shipped, it lights up. You're, there you're just actually showing people a picture of the full process. And even those kinds of visualizations can really help change people's attitudes. So even if they don't know exactly where they are in the stage, sometimes just a compelling picture of what's being done overall, that alone can be enough transparency to already start people thinking more positively which means you don't need staff, you just need someone to create a picture that people see commonly, and you don't need this sort of updating thing, and then again, you're doing a cheaper intervention than having things happen over here. It's a great question, though. We do think a lot, when we work with companies, we try these things out, and it turns out that even if it's cool and customers like it, if it costs too much money, they say, we're not doing that anymore, we're gonna switch back to what we were doing before. Okay, so um, we have time for just maybe one more question, so, um, can I maybe just invite? Okay. Thank you. This has to be an amazing question because it's the last one. Is it? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, my name's Uwe from uh, Falcon Crest. Um, you are a uh, professor of business administration, but what yes. you, but you are talking about centers around psychology. And then when you say you're a psychologist as well, that makes sense. <laughs> um, we talk about trust and transparency. Um, would you say that trust is a, a perception? Um, if I perceive you as someone who is trustworthy, I'm more transparent with you. But if I perceive that you are not a trustworthy person, then I tend not to be transparent. Would that be the case? So um, sometimes transparency is like a double-edged sword. If you are a company and you disclose everything, your cost price, everything, your competitors will make use of of that information against you. In the end, you lose out. What, what, what's your comment on that? Thanks. Yeah, so I th I, to the first part of your question, um, when I think about uh, trust, I, it is, many, many people will measure trust, trust in government, trust in anything as a, on a scale. You know, do you trust this organization? And those measures are, are useful uh, to take, but what we're interested in is measuring the behavioral consequences of trust. So in other words, if someone says, I trust this company or I trust this government, but it doesn't influence their behavior, I don't really care where they are on that scale. 
What I care about is are they engaging in behavior that shows that they trust. So we're always, when we design our interventions, we're always, the outcome measure is never how do you feel. It's always will you take an action now. So if I've shown you that government does this, what we want to do is say, will you sign up to go to a town hall meeting? That's the kind of behavior that we want to drive where it's driven by feelings of trust maybe, but what we care about is the behaviors that you're engaging in more than necessarily how you're feeling. I care about those too because I'm a psychologist, but in the end we do want the behavior as the output. And I forgot the second part of your question. Can you remind me the second part? You can just shout it and I'll repeat it. <laughs> I was so engrossed with your answer and I forgot. Um, I think the uh, second question was, uh, oh, the double-edged sword, Tran transparency is a double-edged sword. It can work for you and it can work against you. Yeah, I think that's probably true. So it, um, it is a decision that you make that can be positive or it can be negative. And again, I mean, what we always try to think about is, um, are you visualizing something that matters a lot to your stakeholders? So sometimes organizations will say, I'll come in and say, I bet you're doing a lot of work that people aren't giving you credit for. And they'll say, thank you. Finally, someone understands everything we're doing. And they say, what we want to visualize is this process. And what I have to say is, I understand that's hard for you, but no one cares about that. In other words, the thing you need to visualize or show to people is something that resonates with them as being important. Those are the things that will matter to them. Sometimes if you visualize the wrong thing, it's worse than visualizing nothing. So we're trying to do sort of the citizen or customer and research to find out what they care about, then think about what we're doing, and then find the sweet spot in between where rather than have transparency be costly, we can show that transparency, again, increases trust, and then most importantly, changes your behavior toward that entity uh, going forward. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Norton. I think we now have a richer and deeper understanding of the nature of trust and expectations and uh, transparency. So please join me in uh, thank you for coming, and ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in thanking Professor Norton. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Norton and Wenung, for sharing uh, your insights and experiences with us. We would now like to invite Mr. Ku, Executive Director of the Centre for Livable Cities, on stage to present the token of appreciation to our speaker and moderator and for photo taking. Mr. Ku, please. Um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of our lecture. We thank you for your participation and do join us in our upcoming lecture featuring Professor Peter Rowe on 27th of August. We will also be seeking your feedback for this lecture via email and would greatly appreciate it if you could give some time to help us improve the lecture series. Have a good evening and we hope to see you again. <laughs>